Hello everyone, we're live, I hope. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, this will be posted on uh, the channel afterwards so that uh, everyone can see it who isn't here now. All right, start, I want to start off with formal apologies for any who may have missed the memorial. Uh, I know some from the Spanish missed it uh, and possibly some from the English uh, uh, European uh, memorial also missed and that was because of a problem with uh, the zoom account I had purchased uh, an expanded package that allowed uh, a lot more uh, attendees it, it broke through the cap of 100 but um, there was nothing on the page after you purchased it to tell you that you had to do one more thing that was only if you you know went exploring and who does that so when I saw it the second time, 100, I capped out at 100. I thought that's too much of a coincidence. And that's when I went and investigated and had to go and chat and Zoom explained to me what it, what happened, where I had to go and how I had to set the license to a particular user. So uh, I imagine we lost quite a few people who just got turned away. And I'm very sorry about that. Uh, and I think so is Zoom because uh, I'd, even though I didn't complain, just the fact that I went on their chat and asked for that guidance midstream, uh, they refunded the, the money we spent uh, on both accounts. So there was a tiny upside. However, um, the, uh, uh, and all is not lost because you see, um, we commemorate the memorial uh, more like the first century Christians did. They, they evidently did it once a week or every time they met, they'd meet for a meal in private homes and part of the meal would be the uh, commemoration, the Lord's evening meal. Uh, they didn't do it just once a year. And uh, we don't do it every week, but we do do it once a month at the uh, last meeting, the last Sunday meeting of the month or the last Saturday in the case of the group that meets in the Eastern Hemisphere, the Australia group. So um, if you want to do it, uh, want to join us, uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. That's the first thing I want to talk about before we get into the three topics. Um, we used to use Faith Life as a calendar for uh, hosting the schedule of the meetings and the links to, to, uh, to Zoom. I, I never really liked using Faith Life because it was, uh, you know, it's linked with organized religion and I, I just uh, don't want to be linked to any kind of organized religion anymore. We like to be non-denominational. However, it was convenient at the time. We didn't have a lot of time or resources and they had a, a ready-made calendar and a brother kindly offered to do it all for us, so we set it all up there, and that was great. Um, however, uh, now we have a calendar set up that we control completely, and that's, I think, a much better arrangement. And to show you, and, and to show you where that is, I'm just going to flip over to the right monitor. Okay, so here's the Berean Pickett's website. All the articles are here, you, all the languages, if you want to read it in different languages. And um, you'll notice over here it says, view meeting calendar and that brings you to this this calendar here and it's basically bereans.net events so you can bookmark that if you like and you can see it you know monthly you can see it weekly uh i like the, the list okay so like today the eastern hemisphere meets at eight o'clock new york time if you click on that You'll see the local time. Well, I'm in Toronto, so it's the same. Still 8 o'clock. But if I was in Queensland, it would show me 10 in the morning. So it's a good way of knowing when the meeting starts in your time zone. And uh, there's little helpful things here. You can use your phone if you want to. There's a meeting ID down here. And there's a special passcode for the phone. Uh, there's also a link here. Find your local number. So if you're not in any one of these areas, you can click on this, it'll take you to a website and show you the local number for your area here around the world, which is quite convenient. But if you just click on this, click here to start meeting, I won't do it, it will take you right to the Zoom meeting and start the Zoom meeting up. So that's how you do it. And I would recommend that you, if you want to join the meetings regularly, you come here every time, every time. And the reason I say you should come here every time is that, um, we might change them. We might change the links, right? Uh, for any number of reasons. 
So you have a source you can always rely on, whatever the link may be. If new meetings are added, if meeting times are changed, it's always going to be there. Okay. So uh, just, just use that as your one-stop source for joining the meetings. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about Christian freedom, the nature of truth, and baptism. Uh, and then I'm going to take questions. I thought the best way of doing this would be divide it into three sections and take questions after each section. Uh, and the reason that that way is we can we won't get overlapping questions from different topics. We we'll stick to one topic at a time. Okay, uh, I'm going to start with baptism simply because when I did my last video, um, I, I invited not in the last but the last video on the memorial. I invited to baptize Christians to the memorial. Without any idea of the stir that would cause, uh, the furor, and in some cases, the, the the term baptized Christian, as if this was a, a negative thing. I had actually one YouTuber accusing me of regressing to watchtower policies of exclusion because I invited only baptized Christians. Uh, I consider baptized Christians to be a tautology, really, because to be a Christian, you have to be baptized. We'll get into that. I can't imagine why anyone would want to partake of the wine and the bread that symbolizes our acceptance of the gift of life without committing to God through the act of baptism. But okay, if you want to partake in the privacy of your own home, I'm not going to reach to the computer monitor and try to stop you, so why the fuss? What baptism represents is a public act of acknowledgement. Jesus said that anyone who confesses him before men, he will confess before God. Anyone who denies him before men, he will deny him before God. That comes from Matthew 10, 32 and 33. So given that, why would anyone argue against being baptized or consider it optional? Uh, I think some people think, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't need to get baptized. Well, I'm sorry, it, that's not the case, at least as, as I understand it. That's, I, I think if you're not willing to, to go before the world and say, I confess Jesus and here's my proof, I'm getting baptized, then you know, it's, it's kind of hard to argue the point that you're really a Christian. Uh, maybe you'll think that's a matter of opinion. That's your opinion. That's mine. But we'll get into opinions in a little while. Uh, if I could comment just for a moment on a side note. I've been doing these videos for a few years. I've been writing articles for even longer. And I've noticed that a lot of XJW sites are characterized by anger. Now, we all went through the anger phase of the five stages of grief. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. But come on now. Anger is only stage two. Why get stuck there? I mean, venting angrily year after year without moving on is akin to... Oh dear, somebody's... Sorry about that. I'm going to turn my my watch off so it doesn't ring anymore. Anyways, um, where was I? Venting angrily year after year. Yeah, okay. It's, it's kind of akin to making a, po a meal of poison, poisoned meal for your, your enemy and then eating it yourself. So the, the um, contemporary English version of the Bible says at Romans 12, 19, Dear friends, don't try to get even. Let God take revenge. In the scriptures, the Lord says, I'm the one to take revenge and pay them back. So I know we feel very hurt by the uh, wasted life we might have felt we had as as a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or a Catholic or whatever time we spent following the dictates of men. But remember, uh, Jesus said, if you remain in my word, you are my disciples, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And that's where we are now. So anyways, I'd like to take some questions on baptism before moving on. So just type them in, in the uh, uh, chat one. I'll do my best to answer them. A tautology is, is a, a, a repeated thing, like a, an intelligent genius. It's a tautology. Um, okay, hearing echoes, everything else okay? I'm not getting any more questions about baptism. If you have any questions about baptism, please type them in. If not, I'll move on. Uh, there were people who were asking, well, should I get rebaptized? 
People are having sound issues. Okay. Uh, is it sound loud enough? I'm not getting any response there. There is only one. Let me just turn off the desktop in case that's causing a problem. Okay. Some people are asking about Matthew 18, 28, 19. Um, there is evidence that it, it's, it's, uh, it, it could be spurious. It could be spurious. We don't know for sure, but we can't say for sure that it isn't. That's the, the whole thing because any, anything prior to um, the third century, any manuscript prior to the third century doesn't have it. It says the sound isn't loud enough. I'm going to turn up the sound a little bit here. Okay, so hopefully that's better. Okay. Um, I'm new to live streaming. So as we do this more and more, and I plan to do it more regularly now, uh, we'll get better at it. Uh, but anyways, the point is whether Matthew 8, 28, 19 is true as written or not, doesn't matter because every baptism in Acts is in the name of Jesus. So you cannot say, oh, you absolutely have to be baptized. Somebody's got to stand there and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because if that were the case, it would be in Acts, and it's not in Acts. But when you baptize in the name of Jesus, well, God's name isn't Jesus. In, in John 17, he says, you have given me your name. And the Holy Spirit is what we get when we get baptized. So it, it, it all works out. Um, I've got a question. Do you believe mikvah was a precedent for baptism? I don't know what mikvah is. I'm sorry. So I can't really answer that. Um, should a person be rebaptized? Matter of conscience. Matter of conscience. Um, it's not for me to say. I was. I was. Even though I was baptized in 63, long before they had the scandalous second question about being baptized in the name of the organization. But still, I was 14. I didn't know what I was doing. And I certainly wasn't being baptized with the hope of being one of the children of God. So I felt that for myself, it would be, I would be comfortable being rebaptized. And so I did get rebaptized. You have to do what you feel comfortable with. First um, John 5, 7 is spurious, and that's been long established as spurious, so we won't get into that. We won't get into the Trinity uh, discussion here. Uh, I am doing videos on the Trinity. There'll be lots of time to discuss that, but here we're going to stick with the topics. Um, yes, the Ethiopian uh, with Philip, that's true. That's, it was a simple request. There's a body of water. I want to get baptized. It's, it's not a, a, a rite or a ritual. It, it's uh, simply a, a, pro, a simple act, and yet at the same time a very powerful act. Um, can't I baptize myself? Why another person? If you're on a desert island you want, and there's no one to do it, I would say, I mean, I don't think God's saying, I'm sorry it's not valid because there's nobody there to do it for you. But why not get someone to do it if there's someone around? You know, that would be my, my thought on that. Again, I'm not making rules because there aren't any. I, I haven't seen anything in the Bible that says, here are the steps to get baptized. You have to follow these steps. Has to be a Christian, etc., etc. I mean, I think of the 12 apostles, it says Jesus didn't baptize anyone. Well, the 12 apostles baptized, but who baptized them? Right? They must have, I'm guessing, they must have baptized each other. So there had to be some guy who was the first one who wasn't baptized to baptize someone. It's the cart before the horse. You know, we can make a great deal about it, but then we're getting all bound up in rules, and, and that's not what it's about. Um, uh, okay, I have to look up John 8, 1, 11, but I've, if it's not on topic, then let's leave it till after. Um, good, okay. I think we've covered baptism. I hope we have. Uh, if not, then uh, my email address, I'll put it right here. You can always email me. I've been getting a lot of emails and answering them about uh, baptism, so I'm just going to type it.
or send it to me afterwards. I'll do my best to answer. Okay, so Christian freedom. That's the next topic. Uh, this is a controversial one, oddly enough, or maybe the one after this, which follows from Christian freedom, the nature of truth. We, I think we've achieved it. We, we've got Christian freedom. We broke free from false religion. We broke free from enslavement to the doctrines of men. I'm not just talking about Jehovah's Witnesses. Any religion that has a, a hierarchy of men from the Catholic Church, the biggest, all the way down to the smallest, have has a, a set of rules that men impose. And you have to follow those rules. Now, yeah, we do have to follow rules, but the rules are written in the Bible. And, and that's it. It's, there's, you can't say, well, yes, but this man interprets that verse this way, and therefore we have to do it that way. No, that's not how it works. But the trouble is that we... Um, don't always realize that once we've achieved freedom, we have to fight for it. You know, it, it, you can't say, well, I'm free now and I'll always be free. No, uh, it'll slip away so quickly we won't even notice it. Because that's because we're predisposed to believe. You know, when God made Adam and Eve, uh, he created them to believe him because that was the way it was supposed to work. A heavenly father who loves you unconditionally, or not unconditionally, but... Uh, completely and who who um, never lies and who always looks for your best interests, if he tells you to do something, you should believe it and do it because it's always going to be good for you. But along comes another fellow and he decides that he can take advantage of this willingness to believe and he tells a lie to the woman and she believes the lie. And here's the thing about liars. They never come with a big sign on their forehead saying, I'm a liar. They always accuse someone else of being a liar. And uh, that's called projection. We've seen that recently in uh, high officials of government calling credible news sources fake because they were the ones that were lying. Second Corinthians 11, 14 and 15 warns us of this. It says, And no wonder for Satan himself keeps transforming himself into an angel of light it is therefore nothing great if his ministers also keep transforming themselves into ministers of righteousness, but their end will be according to their works. So Satan is an angel of light. That's how he projects himself, but he's not really. He's the father of the lie. And those who serve him, his ministers, also appear to be righteous men. Because you're not going to convince anybody if they think you're a liar. They have to think you're telling the truth. That's why the Bible tells us, and this isn't a suggestion, it's a command, to, well, let me read it. 1 John 4, 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Test the spirits, right? What is the spirit behind uh, anyone? What motivates them? The world was taught a very valuable lesson recently. Uh, a few years ago, an anonymous poster made claims about being a high-level government official with top security clearance, Q clearance, I think he called it. I'm saying he because I'm assuming it's a guy. could be a girl. could be a 14-year-old kid working out of his mother's apartment, for all we know. He was anonymous, and yet millions chose to believe this nonsense he was spewing, claiming that Democrats, Hollywood celebrities, and and billionaires were all part of a Satan-worshipping pedophile ring. One fool even went to free the, the children that were trapped inside a pizzeria basement as part of this ring. Turned out the pizzeria didn't have a basement. Why were they so credible? Why would they overlook credible news sources from people they could see, people whose backgrounds they could check, people whose sources they could verify, people whose credentials were available, why would they discard all that and believe an unknown, unaccredited, anonymous individual? That's a good question. If you want to learn more about that, there's a book by a colleague, uh, James A. Beverly. You can get it on uh, Amazon. It's called The QAnon Deception. I'll put a link to it in the description of the video after this is over. But what I'm saying is, what spirit would motivate a person to do that, to make such outrageous claims? and mislead so many. I mean, people ended up in jail because they believed him. 
That's a very good question. The thing for us is, how do we avoid following, following suit in a religious sense or in a, in a scriptural sense or a spiritual sense? Well, at John 10, 4 and 5, Jesus tells us, when he has got all his own out, he's talking about a shepherd, he goes before them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they will by no means follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Now here's the point. I'm teaching you what I know from the Bible. I'm one of many people on the internet and elsewhere who teach others what they know. But in, in reality, all Christians should be teaching others. I, you learn something from the Bible, you're prone to teach it to others that don't know that thing. That's fine. That's what we're supposed to do. But the point is, the voice that we should be sounding is the voice of Jesus. It, it's the voice from Scripture. And a true sheep, a true lover of truth, will hear that voice. It might be coming from my lips or somebody else's lips. doesn't matter. They'll recognize that's not Eric Wilson speaking. That's the words of Jesus. He's merely like a transmitter or a radio right? If, however, I start speaking from my own originality, then the true sheep, not the false, but the true sheep will say, that's not the voice of Jesus. That's the voice of a man. And he'll turn away. He won't follow that voice. The majority of people are quite prone to follow the voice of strangers. But that shouldn't be the way for us. So before we get into the nature of truth, is are there any questions about what I've just said? Let's have a look here. We're still talking about Matthew 8, 28, 8, 19. Please drop it. It's not worth talking about because it doesn't matter whether it's true or false. It doesn't change anything unless you want to support the Trinity and let's, let's leave the Trinity aside. Hmm. Okay, no other questions? All right, good. The nature of truth. Ah. Since we started the, the congregation, when, when I first started uh, writing, on Berean pickets. I only wanted to learn more about the Bible. The only purpose I had was research and I was hoping to find others like me. Uh, I found others like me and they wanted to do more and so we started meetings. We used go-to meeting at the time and we had meetings and that was fine. I'm, part of me didn't want to do that because I had been meeting five times a week, five meetings a week, three times a week. Um, not counting service arrangements, and I was just tired of meetings, especially the boring ones, and that's what you get in jw.org. So I was quite happy not to have any more meetings. So to have meetings again, well, okay. But it turned out to be very advantageous because these were different. These were meetings in which people could freely express themselves and share Bible research. Okay, but here's where you get the problem of freely expressing yourself. Because the Bible talks about uh, people disguising themselves in cloaks of righteousness, but they're really ravenous wolves. You see, you get a bunch of sheep, and what does a wolf see? An easy meal. So how do they do this? Well, they try to blur the idea about what truth really is. Now, if you look at John 18, 37 and 38, uh, there you read Jesus speaking. He's before Pilate, and he says, For this I have been born... And for this I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone that is on the side of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? See, Jesus knew there was such a thing as absolute truth. Pilate's view was different. Pilate wor worshipped pagan gods. They were mythological figures, the fabrication of imaginative minds preached by mere men and ultimately sourced from Satan. 
How could he possibly know the truth and distinguish it from lies in such an environment? Yet now, standing before him was a man who could literally raise the dead, walk on water, heal any and all diseases, calm a raging storm. This man had credentials. Yet Pilate turned him over to the angry crowd to be killed. It's QAnon all over again. It would seem Pilate could not recognize truth even when it was staring him in the face. And for that matter, neither could the Jewish leaders who feigned righteousness but were really wolves in sheep's clothing. You see, there's truth and there's falsehood. And in between these two, there is an unknown. But the unknown is not um, opinion. It is unknown truth. The truth is still there. It's just we don't know it. And that's where we can get into problems. An opinion is, um, I think apples are better than oranges. That's my opinion. Okay, that's not truth. And it'll never be truth. It's truth for me. You might say, no, I like oranges better than apples. They're better than apples. That's your opinion. That's truth for you. But there is no absolute truth there. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about life-altering um, truth, life and death decisions. So you get into some, some, some discussions where uh, people will say, well, that's your opinion. Or they might even say, you have your opinion and I have mine. And it's all a matter of opinion. It's all a matter of interpretation. It's kind of like Pilate again. What is truth? There is no real truth. It's all opinion. So that means it doesn't really matter. This is a uh, Tim Hortons coffee. Tim Hortons is like the Starbucks of Canada, although it's much older than Starbucks. I like Tim Hortons coffee better than Starbucks coffee. That's my opinion. I can go to Tim Hortons and order a medium double-double and say it. I like Tim Hortons better than Starbucks. I think it's better. Do you think they'll give me a coffee for free because of my opinion? Is my opinion worth anything? No, they'll still want one of these. This is a toonie. It's worth $2 Canadian. This is truth. This is a fact. My opinion will not get me a cup of coffee. This fact will get me a cup of coffee. That's the point I'm trying to make, is that... Um, there are facts in the Bible, and we can discern them. And people will try to cloud them over, but if we let them, then we get into a situation where uh, we cannot advance. We cannot advance toward truth. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman that you won't worship me anymore in Jerusalem at the temple. You won't worship me here, or I won't worship God, sorry, here on the mountain. God is looking for worshipers who will worship him in spirit and truth. So truth is important. Now, sometimes people get very contentious about this and they feel they're being censored. You know, they have a right to their opinion. I have a right to my opinion. It's freedom of speech. Okay, I agree. You have a right to say whatever you believe. That's absolute. I don't have a right to listen. No one has the right. I'm sorry. I don't have the obligation to listen. I have a right not to listen. You have a right to speak. I have a right not to listen. We both have rights. So what happens when somebody tries to push their rights on others and f try to force others? Then what they're doing is taking away someone else's freedom. Isn't that the case? I mean, if someone says, you've got to listen to me because my opinion is valid, then they're taking away my freedom not to listen. What if I don't want to listen? What if somebody comes into your house, you've prepared a beautiful meal, you've invited friends to sit at this meal, and they sit down, and one of them says, terrible things about your father. Uh, what are you going to do? You're going to say, well, you have your right to your opinion. You can sit here and eat my food and slander my father all you want, because that's your right. No, you're going to throw him out of the house, because it's your house. He can stand in the corner and say what he wants about your father, but not in your house. So when it comes to a Christian gathering, you have a gathering of Christians who got together to study God's word and someone comes in with their opinion. Well, they've got a right to express it and everyone else has a right to challenge it. But that's where it stops, right? And if they continue to push an opinion that everybody else thinks is false, then it's the congregation that has to decide. And people say, well, that's Watchtower all over again. No, it's not. No, because Watchtower 
says, you can't disagree with, with us and, the, and three elders are going to decide, right? And that's where it ends. But what if the whole congregation sat down and you said, listen, um, let's take 1914. 1914 is false. I'm going to prove it from the Bible. The whole congregation listens. What would happen? Then you'd have all the people listening to the evidence and truth would find its way. Why? Because the spirit would lead it. And some would go away. Some would say, no, no, I'm sticking with what I was taught since I was a child. Probably the majority would do that. Well, that's to be expected. But those who love truth would come out. And that's, that's really what a congregation should be. It should be a group of truth lovers who are willing to examine truth and are not willing to listen to lies anymore. So that's pretty much all I have to say about the nature of truth now. I'm sure there's going to be questions and maybe I can amplify these things a little bit better in response to the questions. Okay, let's see what we've got here. <laughs> yes, and heroes and heroes, I agree. Swift kick in the pants. Okay. Um, let me give you an example. I'm not getting that many questions, so let me give you an example. Please don't talk about the vaccine here. Why is the faith life calendar still up? Okay, well, there's a difference of opinion. Uh, some people felt that it was necessary to allow all teachings, no matter what, and that's their right. You know, everybody can believe anything they want and preach anything they want in the congregation. Um, so the uh, brother who very kindly set up faith life for us has uh, decided to keep that uh, platform going and, and hold his own meetings. You're free to go there if you like. Um, but let me give you an example of the danger of that, okay? Uh, let's take a teaching that would seem to be insignificant, all right? There's uh, an account where Jephthah was going to be fighting the enemy of Israel, and so he was selected by God to do this, but he was insecure. And so he made a vow. He didn't have to, but he decided to make a vow. He made a vow that he would sacrifice. And the word is burnt offering in Hebrew. And he would make a burnt offering of whoever came out to greet him, the first one to come out to greet him. Now, uh, some would say, well, that's symbolic. He's speaking in a symbolic way. Others would say, no, he literally was engaging in, in sacrifice. He was going to take somebody and like you would with a ram, you kill it and you burn it in the altar to God. Okay, so there's two different points of view. Now, a careful examination of scripture should reveal which of those two points is right. So here's the thing. Um, I won't get into all the arguments. I'll, I'm, I actually plan to do a video on that because it is a bit of a contentious issue. But here's the thing. If it was literally a burnt offering, then God accepted something that he says was abhorrent, that had never come up into his heart. He accepted human sacrifice. Uh, and because after he made this vow, God gave him the victory, right? He didn't say, don't make that vow. I don't accept that. Or he didn't fail to give him the victory because that was a, a sinful act and he couldn't support it. No, he gave him the victory. And the account says that, that uh, Jephthah's daughter was spent her life as, as a virgin. She never married. That was the sacrifice. She was devoted to the work of God, just like um, Samuel became devoted to the temple. He was sacrificed to the temple. His mother gave him over at the age of probably five. So that's one way of looking at it. But let's say you say, well, it's a matter of opinion. Well, is it? Because in the one case, we have an explanation that doesn't uh, paint God as a, uh, a sinner. In the other case, we have God accepting a sin as something acceptable, making him culpable. And this slanders God. So you see how it's, it's like there's a little wedge now. The little wedge goes into our 
our perception. And somebody comes along and says, you know, I believe in hellfire and there's things in the Bible that support hellfire. Oh, okay. Well, if he could allow human sacrifice, he, why not? He could torture people forever and ever, unendingly, and still be a God of love. I can carry those two ideas in my head. You see? And that's how corruption comes into the congregation. So uh, at some point, we've got to say, no, I'm sorry. You can't talk about that here. And people will say, well, yeah, how do you, how do you know you're right? <laughs> okay. Um, you're standing on a bridge and I'm standing on the street. And you look down the road and you say, Eric, there's a truck coming at great speed. It's going to run you over. Get off the road. And I say, no, I don't see a truck. I don't see a truck. But you say, there's a truck. I can see it. And I look again. Nope, I don't see it. There's, you're, you're imagining things. It's your interpretation, right? There's no truck. My opinion is that there's no truck. Well, sooner or later, one of us is going to be proven right. Either you're imagining things and the truck you imagine seeing will just pass through me because it's a mirage. Or you're seeing a real truck. And I'll find out that you were telling the truth, but it'll be a little late for me. See, the thing is, all of this is not um, academic. The Bible says at Luke 17, 1 and 2, it is unavoidable that causes for stumbling should come. Nevertheless, woe to the one through whom they come. It would be more advantageous for him if a millstone were hung from his neck and he were thrown into the sea than for him to stumble one of these little ones. See, there is, there are consequences. And we can't think of these things as academic. We're not a bunch of uh, academes sitting around in a, a boardroom discussing points of view that don't really matter. This is life and death stuff. So that's pretty much where I stand uh, on me, uh, Christian meetings and Christian gatherings. We have to we have to stick to the truth, but that doesn't mean that one person tells others what to do. It's the body. And Matthew eighteen seventeen, what did Jesus say? If he doesn't listen to two or three, put him before the whole congregation, not a committee of three men, the whole congregation, and the whole congregation will listen to the evidence and then make a ruling. And the spirit works through the whole congregation. And so there, it's, it's the voice of the congregation that speaks. It's the conscience of the, of the congregation that decides. We, for example, a while ago decided that when we read 1 Corinthians 11, 5 and 13, that women could pray. It says right there, women prayed and prophesied. So we said, well, we can't say no. We can't tell half of the congregation, sorry, you can't pray. Only, only our half can pray, your half cannot. Because it said right in the Bible, they prayed. No, well, there were a number of our brothers who said, nope, not accepting that. That's my opinion. Fine. They left. They formed their own little group. And they have to this day their own little group. And I'm sure they read the Bible well and they understand it well. But when it comes to that, they say, have to have the congregation. You can't participate. We're free to go where we want. Okay. Uh, Psalm 119, 142. There's a question here. Let's have a look. Psalm 119, 142. Your righteousness is everlasting and your law is true. Yes, it does. It does. But let's not get confused here. Because God had a law before the law was given to Moses. And he had a law when Christ came that replaced the law of Moses with an even better law. Ultimately, the law of God is love God with your whole body, mind, soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And that's really all we need. Uh, I teach I teach the uh, that the sacrifice of, of Jephthah's daughter uh, not being a literal sacrifice, I teach that as truth. I don't believe that's opinion because I believe the overriding evidence from all of Scripture supports that. Okay, anything? I'm just going to scroll up, see if there's any other questions. 
Hebrews 13, 17. Ah, that's a good one. Yeah, um, let's have a look at that. I mean, matter of fact, I'm going to switch over to that monitor. And let's make this a little bigger for everybody to see. Hebrews 13, 17. Okay. Yeah, notice it says, I'm looking at all these translations. Hopefully you can see it. Obey. You know, obey. King James, obey. Obey, 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 obey. It's always obey your leaders. Obey your spiritual leaders. Uh, this one says have confidence. Good for you, New International Version, for getting it right. Uh, why am I saying they get it right and the rest get it wrong? Okay, let's look at the interlinear. Here it says obey, right? Okay, well, there's the word. Must be right. But remember, these are translated by men supporting hierarchies, religious hierarchies that pay them to do these translations. So, notice this word, patho or pitho. Pitho or pitho, I'm not sure. I'm not Greek. It says to persuade or have confidence, to urge. So the definition and usage is never obey. Why is it translated as obey in Hebrews 13, 17? When everywhere else, look, persuaded, trusted, went over, persuade, trusted, persuaded, trusted, on, on down, followed. There's one for obey, only the King James Version. Um... Wait a minute, where's Acts 5.29 here? It's missing. Because that says we must obey God as ruler rather than men, but it's not here. That means this word is not found at Acts 5.29. Let's have a look at Acts 5.29. Here we are. Different word, but a similar word. Here we have to obey, to obey one in authority. There's patho, the one we just saw, persuade, right? So now they've taken persuade and added another uh, part to the word, he who comes first. In other words, persuade someone who comes for, or be persuaded by someone who comes first. You know, if God says, do this, it's not persuasion. He's telling us we do it. You know, yes, sir, no, sir, we obey. That's the, the meaning of this word. That's how it's used. And they said, we will obey God as ruler rather than men. But in all the other cases, when it says, obey your rulers, the word's different. It really means be persuaded by. So uh, an, an elder in the congregation, a priest, whatever authority there may be in a particular group or congregation, will reason with you from Scripture and try to persuade you. And you should be allow yourself to be persuaded as long as what he's telling you is in line with the one we obey, this word, because that is God. So we would not disobey God by being persuaded by someone else. So that's what Hebrews 13, 17 means. Hopefully I've answered that. John, you're still on, John Cook's still on about the Trinity. Yes, Jesus is divine. No argument there. That doesn't make him God, but Again, we're getting into the Trinity. Let's get off that. I mean, they've been arguing that for 1,600 years. <laughs> By the way, um, there has been rumors circulating that I uh, I disfellowship somebody from the congregation, from our, our, our group, or kick them out. Um, there are, If you want to come to the meeting and, and ask the brothers what they saw, you'll find that that's not true. Matter of fact, at the end of a meeting, we had a long, long discussion about a scriptural point, and not just a scriptural point, but actually conduct that was that was uh, upsetting some of the brothers and sisters. And uh, at the end, I made it very clear by saying it three times that we wanted this particular individual to continue to associate. We didn't want him to go, right? So there, that's that's my truth. I believe there is both subjective, I'm answering nomadic Hebrew, based upon your answer to my last question, do you believe the Bible, biblical definition of truth is subjective or objective? 
it depends on the context, but essentially objective, because ultimately truth comes from God. And when Jesus speaks, he speaks truth. So I would say objective in that sense. Um, I hope that answers the question. I can't answer it more specifically without some specificity, some example. Um, okay, sorry, John. No problem. Carry on. Uh, no, uh, JW News. Uh, on the question of Jephthah's daughter, I do not insist others obey my view. I insist that they respect the view of the congregation. So if on the question of Jephthah's daughter, the entire congregation wants to believe that Jephthah stabbed his daughter in the heart, put her on an altar and lit her aflame to, to worship God, if the entire congregation wants to believe that, then the person promoting that idea will stay with the congregation and I will go. That's really what happens. They wouldn't be expelling me. I would decide to go. Just like the brothers who didn't want to accept that women should pray, left. Because ultimately, it's up to God to decide who loves truth and is worshiping in spirit and truth. Someone's asking about the cross. Uh... Was Jesus killed with a, a revolver or an automatic? Would it be an issue for discussion? Was he hung or did he have his head chopped off? You know what I mean? Like we're talking about methods of, of execution. Does it matter whether it was a stake or a cross? Now, should you worship the cross? Should you carry it around your neck? Should you kiss it? That's a different thing. I don't, I don't agree with anything that uh, is, promotes idolatry. Idolatry is definitely a bad thing. The Bible makes it very clear. Flee from idols. So I don't believe that we should treat the cross as a sacred symbol. But as to whether he died on a cross or a stake, um, it seems the evidence is stronger for the cross. Uh, simply because uh, it was used. There's no doubting that. Was it used for him? Well, it said that, see the holes in my hands, that the nails made, right? plural. So if he was nailed this way, then two nails went into his hand for there to be nails. These aren't little nails. These are spikes. His hands would have been shredded. Even with one nail, the, uh, a tremendous amount of damage was done. So it seems to be more logical that his hands were spread. That's one of the arguments used to support the idea that it was a cross. But again, so what? Maybe it wasn't. Who cares? You know, we're arguing over what caliber uh, was in the gun. <laughs> um, yes, the congregation decides what's true. Well, the Holy Spirit decides what's true, doesn't it? It's the, the Holy Spirit guides us to all the truth. So it can't guide one person. Because if I say, well, the Holy Spirit told me this is true, now I'm the leader. And if I'm the leader, then I go wrong, I mislead you all. And that's what the governing body does. They said they are speaking uh, by Holy Spirit. They are the guardians of doctrine. They actually use that phrase, guardians of doctrine, G-O-D. They have sat themselves in the seat of Moses, along with others. They're not the only ones. Just reading some more here. Yes, we do have 50,000. Well, I don't know if it's 50,000, but we have thousands, tens of thousands of denominations. Um, Jesus said that the wheat would grow among the weeds. And you notice that in that parable, he said the wheat is gathered in bundles and burned. I'm sorry, the weeds. The weeds are gathered in bundles and burned. The wheat is taken to the storehouse. So first, the wheat is taken 
as a group into the storehouse, but the weeds are bundled. Now, I don't know if there's any significance to that or if you just stated it that way, but there are, there's a lot more weeds than wheat and the wheat is growing among the weeds. And the wheat is told to get out of her, my people, if you do not want to share in her sins. So therefore his people, the wheat, is in among her and they have and has to get out before the destruction comes upon the, the weeds, the weeds that are burned in the fire. Make of that what you will. Uh, I don't want to talk about replacement theology now, uh, nomadic Hebrew. I will be doing a video on that at some point. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm still sharing the screen. Thank you so much for telling me that. I, there we are. There we are. Um, I really need somebody here with me to to manage this. Um, okay. Anything else? Again, uh, un, unidos, unidos asks whether we've kicked out people. Okay, well, yeah. Yes, yeah, sometimes we do kick people out. Um, I, and I should explain that. I also block comments on, on the YouTube channel. Um, so there's several reasons for that. Uh, recently, President Trump was blocked from Twitter and Facebook. That was pretty unprecedented. Um, why? Because they saw that there were consequences, serious consequences to providing a platform by which lies could be disseminated. And so once they had, once they knew these were lies, they didn't want responsibility. They didn't want to get sued, right? For promoting lies. Like there's a billion dollar lawsuit from that company that makes the voting machines. Okay. So whatever their motivation, they realized that there was a limit. Um, if you, if you comment on the website or if you comment on the YouTube channel, uh, that's fine. Uh, even if you disagree, that's fine. You have a right to disagree. And if you want to promote, uh, an alternate view, that's fine too. However, um, if you say, Hey, here's a Jim Dandy little soapbox somebody's got, and they've got thousands of people reading it. So I'm just going to hop on here and preach my message. Well, sorry, I didn't go to all this work to set up this YouTube channel. So it's someone to provide a soapbox for every Tom, Dick and Harry. That's just the way it is. I make no apologies for that. So if you have a long, long comment preaching who knows what, um, and it's not true or, um, very, very subjective, it, it's gone. Um, if you are belligerent, it's gone. If you attack people, it's gone. If you, um, that, cause often that's the case. You get all these ad hominem attacks and, uh, I, I I'll say something and people say, oh, you've gone back to the watchtower. No, I haven't. The fact that I might, they might have something right. Wow. Imagine after 140 years, there's a few things they got right. I would think you'd expect them to have some things, right? I mean, it'd be ridiculous if they had nothing right. Uh, you can't build a really good lie unless you have a foundation of truth. So uh, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, but there's people who just have so much hatred for the Watchtower. They just want to, anything the Watchtower believes, it must be wrong. So they go with something else. And that's just another way of getting into uh, another version of the lie. So. So there are limits. Uh, I'm going to do a video explaining exactly the etiquette, but basically I would like an environment where people can come and feel comfortable and not feel uh, that all there is here is, is hatred or anger or belligerence. That's not the environment. It, again, it's like a house. You know, you have a house, you invite people into the house. 
There are rules, house rules. They have to behave. If they don't want to be behave well, it's a free world. They can go start their own internet channel, their own YouTube channel, or their own website, and say whatever they want. You know, and uh, you know, based on what the law permits. Okay, hopefully that's uh, answered that question. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, you've proven my point. See, anything I don't believe, uh, I I uh, I delete. If I can prove it's a lie from the Bible and misleading others and harming others, yeah, I'm going to delete it. I don't want to harm people. I don't want my channel to be harmful. Nobody's uh, kicking anybody out for asking questions on heels. I, I actually like people to ask questions. Okay, well, I don't see any new questions. I hope I've answered everything. Uh, how do I know Trump was lying? There is a website that you can go to that lists over 30,000 lies. Um, and it shows him, him speaking, and then him speaking something else, contradicting himself. Not always, but there are many of those cases where he, he's, or he says things that can be proven to be false. Uh, that's how you know he's lying. You, that's how we know every, anybody's lying. We have a standard. We, in our case, we have the Bible. And the Bible says one thing, so you go to it, and then somebody says another, and you say, well, here's my map, this is the Bible, this is my map, and you're saying that there's no street on this map called whatever, and I see it right here. That's how we know somebody's lying. If otherwise, how do we ever know? How could we protect ourselves? from lies if, we, if there's no way of knowing. There obviously is a way of knowing. I don't understand the question about making an idol out of the Bible. If you put the Bible down and start bowing down to it, worshiping it, yeah, that would be wrong. I don't remember Anthony Percy ever being kicked out of the meetings. At least no meeting I attended. Yes, I still consider the church as Babylon the Great. I consider Christendom as Babylon. That's my understanding. I'm not saying that's true. That's my understanding. It fits the facts. And when I say churches, I mean Christendom. And when I say Christendom, I mean Watchtower Bible and Tract Society included false, false Christianity. Percy got kicked out of this live chat for asking questions. All right, I wasn't aware of that. I'm not sure what questions he asked. Next goal for the channel. Um, I'm almost done with all the false doctrines of JW.org. So uh, once I've done with that, I want to get into some really positive videos on positive things. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Could you tell me what question Anthony Percy asked that resulted in him being kicked out? Yeah, I do want to do a video on the cross in greater detail. No, Jesus come to create a religion. Jesus came 
to gather the children of God to form an administration by which all humanity could be saved. I think the persecution in Russia is wrong. You don't persecute people. If they're, if they're individually committing crimes, you prosecute, prosecute the crime. The prophecy of Daniel, which one? There's so many. One world government. Uh, I know that's a common belief among evangelicals. The book, I'm working as much as I can. Unfortunately, this week has been very disruptive. And so uh, there was another week lost, but I'm hoping to spend the next three or four weeks trying to finish that book and get it, get it going. But it'll still be months, apparently. It takes months to go through the whole process of publishing. Granted, Cassandra, wearing a cross isn't the same as worshiping it. That's true. Um, I'm not going to make rules that aren't in the Bible. The Bible says to flee from idolatry. So you might have an, something other people use as an idol in your home as an, a piece of art or a piece of jewelry. It's a matter of conscience. I don't believe there are subliminal images in the Watchtower articles. I know a lot of people do. The fact is the human brain is a, an engine for finding order out of chaos. You look at clouds and you can see all kinds of patterns. Um, so it's quite possible that we're seeing patterns because of the power of the brain that aren't there. Personally, I don't think they're smart enough to do that. I mean, I've seen these videos that they make. And it's so sad. There's no, there's no depth of understanding there. None. Like the recent video on the sheep and the goats. The, the way they apply it, it just makes a mockery of God, really. I plan to do a video on that, but again, it takes time. Uh, has all the Torah and the prophets been fulfilled in Matthew 5, 17 to 18 requires? Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Let's have a look. Uh, 